Okay, so open pedagogy. Um, I first got interested in this when I attended a workshop by, um, let me see, uh, by Robin DeRosa. Um, actually, I listened to a podcast prior. I think she was on the Teaching in Higher Ed podcast. Then she gave a presentation at CIT, and I believe it was May of 2018. Um, and it was just, her arguments were really compelling. Uh, and then we invited her to be on our podcast. We invited her to give her talk on campus. and. And that further made me commit to this. So in general, open pedagogy involves a process where students are not just being passive consumers of academic content, they're actively creating something. They're creating knowledge in some way or creating resources where they're taking what they're learning and then applying it in some way that can be shared. Um, typically, the sharing is done publicly, but some open pedagogy projects are just done within the class or is used for future cohorts of students. Um, and we'll talk about some ways in which that could occur. But in general, there's this aspect of it where they're creating something that other people will use. And that's one of the main advantages of this in terms of the motivation that it provides to students. And and I, I lost the focus for my remote here. Uh, okay. Um, it also involves active learning because they're not just reading and taking tests or writing papers, they're actively engaging with the content. And that there's a tremendous body of evidence suggesting that active learning techniques are much more effective in encouraging long-term recall of concepts. One of the things that was really compelling when Robin DeRosa was talking about this in these various formats is actually a term that was first used by David Wiley, and that is open pedagogy assignments are non-disposable. A disposal assignment would be the type of thing we generally do in most of our classes, where students will create something, they'll write a paper, they'll, they'll create homework assignments, they'll take exams, and all that is generally delivered to us either on paper, if we're in a classroom perhaps, or electronically in a Dropbox, and all that is stored typically in Blackboard, we give them feedback, and then the semester ends, and all that disappears. If they wrote a paper and they kept a copy of it, they at least have that, but it, the assignments generally don't have any life beyond the course. Anything they create in the course is stored in the Blackboard course shell, which students lose access to right after the semester ends. So the assignments that students are creating here have a life that extends beyond the semester. So anything they create is going to persist and it's going to be something they, they can point to, that they can refer back to as a sample of their work. So, and there's lots of things you can do. Many people use, many, many institutions have um, digital portfolios for students where they save samples of the work so that they have the same type of thing, which in a sense is a form of open pedagogy. Well, or it has many of the same aspects as this does for that purpose. It often involves some type of service learning where you're creating something that's going to have benefit or value for others. It could be other students, could be for society, it could be a resource in general that's provided over the network. Let me just briefly talk about some broad categories of examples. One is to provide annotations for online content that um, Hypothesis is a tool, for example, that have been has been used for about a decade now for this type of thing, where students can go out and read things and leave comments on it. They can provide annotations that are publicly shared. Um, they can also, and this is one of the things that Robin DeRosa did, uh, just going back a little bit, um, what she what she noted was that she was teaching courses in early American his, American literature, and students were paying hundreds of dollars for anthologies of early American literature that all consisted of work that were in the public domain. And she realized that perhaps she didn't really need to have students pay hundreds of dollars for access to free materials that was publicly available. However, she was using it because of the quality of the annotations of footnotes and other things that were embedded in the text. So what she had students do is create a textbook for future 
versions of the class where the students would find that content and they would annotate it. They would provide the annotations using hypothesis and then just create collections that became textbooks for the future. So they were doing the annotations and they were actively learning by putting the materials they were reading in terms of the broader historical context, in terms of the literature of the day, in terms of the cultural context of that. So they were actually doing the types of things that the editors were doing in the past, but they were actively engaging with the text and putting it in this context in a way that could then be shared by future classes. Um, another common form of an open pedagogy project is to have students create blogs. Um, they could be blogs within the class. We've got that really crappy blogging tool within Blackboard, which you can always use. But again, that goes away at the end of that. Students also, though, have access to Blogger in our Google instance. As of last year, that was finally turned on on campus. So you could have student blogs that could be public facing. They could be restricted to the class, but they could create blogs on any topic. Um, they could, for example, be blogging about their experiences with the pandemic within the context of your course. They could be using a blog to reflect on their learning process. They could be writing blogs on aspects of what they're learning that could then be publicly shared for to a wider audience. There's also wikis. Um, one of the most interesting example of a wiki project was, um, I heard it on a podcast about six months ago, was a Portuguese language instructor, instructor in Texas um, who had students write, I think it was in, I forgot what city it was in Texas, but in any case, um, he noted that on the Portuguese wiki, there was no information about their city on Wikipedia in Portuguese. So he had the students create a Wikipedia page on the city in Portuguese, um, which gave them some really good practice interacting with taking things that they know and translating it into Portuguese in a context that was public, but was providing a public resource for others. Glossaries are things that are often done. We, uh, Maya Brown, who was in the theater department until she left this past year, had students create a blo um, glossaries associated with Shakespeare's, um, I forgot what it was, was it, was it the tragedies? Well, in any case, it was a Shakespeare related glossary. Um, many people have had students do this for the discipline they're working on, having them create public glossaries of key terms uh, that they were learning and so forth that then are shared on the, the, the internet in some form. Um, Podcast projects is something that many people have also done. Vanderbilt University has a large institution-wide class podcast project where many, many classes have students create podcasts that are then shared on their own podcast channels. And they also have a, an overall Vandybox channel for, you know, Vanderbilt as a whole, where they take the best podcasts from all those classes and they share those on a public, on a, a larger, more more heavily listened to public facing podcasts. Um, and that's something that can be done really easily just with students' mobile devices. Um, students can create videos. Um, some faculty, for example, have had students create videos designed to teach high school con students the basics of the discipline so that they take the concepts they're learning and are, have to come up with ways of explaining them in ways that that new that future students, perhaps in their class or high school students learning chemistry, for example, could use to learn some of the basics of chemistry. And when you have to put together something like that and explain it to someone else, you're going to learn it much more deeply than if you're just reading and taking tests on the concept. You know, many faculty know that um, and I felt this way myself, that I really learned the basics of my discipline most effectively when I had to explain it to students. That once you have to put it together in a way that other people can explain, you tend to learn it in ways that you just don't forget it. Having students do these types of things, the glossaries of podcasts or videos, where they're trying to explain what they're learning to other people is a really effective way of encouraging deeper and more persistent learning. 
Another project, and this one's a little bit tricky, is to have students do research projects that are then shared publicly. I know in econometrics, there's a few classes where all the students' work is published on the web. Um, well, the first time I discovered that was because a student had actually taken one of those papers and tried sharing it as their own work. So there are some issues there where it could become you know, a source of material for academic integrity issues. But on the other hand, if they're doing some interesting research and they know that other people might be reading it, that could be really helpful. Um, going back to the wikis, actually, I used that once in my, I was teaching, we were, we had lost our history of economic thought um, professor. And I was, I was going to, I filled in for a couple of years teaching that while we were in between people. And instead of using an expensive textbook, I had students create a wiki on on the history of economic thought, where it just divided up, where we came up with a list of schools of thought and some of the key economists in those, those schools. And they wrote three, each one was a primary author of a Wikipedia page on either a school of thought or a particular contributions of an economist. And then they were all linked and networked to each other. And, um, and that worked pretty well. And they did weekly presentations on that. So essentially, they were writing the equivalent of a textbook as they went. Um, and books is another project. This is something I've had students do the last couple of years, and that's worked pretty well. One of the most interesting cases of that, though, was by one of our colleagues at SUNY, um, SUNY Buffalo, or yeah, SUNY Buffalo, who was teaching a course in wellness, and there were three major things she wanted to cover, and no single textbook covered all three of the areas that she wanted to work on. It was community health or a similar topic. And so each of the books, though, was about $150 or more each. So she didn't want to charge students like five or $600 for the, the book. She had a class of about 100 students. So she came up with essentially a list of chapters for it. And she broke the students up into groups. She wrote the initial contribution to it. And then she had each group of students write the chapter for the next module that they were going to be addressing in class. And they all provided feedback and so forth. And at the end of the term, uh, she was able to get a small grant from SUNY to actually have bound copies of those books distributed to all of the students who were the authors of that. So 100 students somehow jointly wrote essentially the textbook on a just-in-time basis. Um, so it was an, an interesting project. And that, that seems a little bit daunting. But I did have students write as one one of the things they were doing in their classes, um, some books as well, and I'm doing a session on that later. But they picked the topic, they they picked the they constructed the outline jointly, and they they did some research and wrote it all up. And that's out on the web, and anyone can use that work, and they can point back to it. One of the things that my students noted. Uh, we actually recorded a podcast with three of them, and this was something that they pretty much all really were enthused about. Was that they now have something that they can share. One of them said that, you know, now when I go back home and I try to explain to my parents what I'm learning in economics, I can refer them to this. They get to see what I've been doing and similarly with their friends. And, and also they mentioned, some of them mentioned that they wanted to list it on their LinkedIn profile or LinkedIn, you know, their resumes and so forth as a signal to potential employers of, you know, the type of work that they're capable of doing. So we've already addressed a little bit of this, but it can be really motivational for students to create something that has some intrinsic value that they, they enjoy. Um, that public audience aspect of it is something that people take seriously. Um, one of the things uh, when I did that Wikipedia project for history of economic thought, um, the person that was replaced actually was um, moved out to Michigan. Uh, Saeed knows him. It was Dave Pachitko. But one of the things I told students is that this is out on the web, and I'm going to invite some, some, some historians of economic thought to look at your stuff, and they may provide feedback and you know, give you some comments on it. And Dave did that a little bit. Uh, and they were really impressed by the fact that other people were out there looking at what they did. Um, the active learning we've addressed. Um, now, if you want to try an open pedagogy project, there's a few things you should consider. One is, you know, don't just do it because it's fun. It should be closely aligned to whatever your course learning outcomes are and make it clear why you're doing this to students so that they see that this is very directly related to what they're trying to learn. 
one of the issues that potentially can come up is student privacy concerns, that if you're going to have work that's publicly shared, how do you deal with cases where students may not, may not want to have their work published on the internet. They may be in an abusive relationship. They may be in some situation where they may be in undocumented, um, you know, um, they may, they may not have citizenship or permanent residency status, and they don't want their name publicly tied to the institution. Um, and those are things you should be willing to address. One way of dealing with it is just simply giving students the option of whether they make their work public or private. Uh, when I've done a podcast project with students, I give them choice of whether they want the podcast shared on the public uh, podcast or whether it would be shared only within the class to the class residents, where it was sent essentially in a Google Drive folder where only members of the class had access to it. Uh, or um, or if you're going to do some, something public facing, you could let students use pseudonyms or something similar. So there are ways around that, but it's something you should be sensitive to. Um, you have to, particularly in the environment where we're in, if you're teaching remotely, you have to come up with some ways or at least give students some suggestions perhaps on how they should arrange how they can organize their collaboration, whether that's going to be done within class times, if it's synchronous, how and how they might collaborate outside. Um, I know in project, one of the things that many people have suggested is that if you're teaching an asynchronous class and students are collaborating and you're forming groups, one thing you might ask them to help form the groups, you can either have use a discussion board and let them post when they're available and what they wanted to work on, just let the groups form from within the discussion. Or perhaps you could do some type of a survey and ask students when they were most free to do work. Some people can only work early in the morning if they, they're, if they have caretaking responsibilities or work responsibilities. Other people might only be available late on night, at night. Some might only be available to work on weekends or some might only be available a few days of the week. That type of information is useful to share so that students are able to come up with some way of collaborating, unless, again, they're going to be working in class. And in the projects I've used, it's usually been a mix of some time spent together in breakout rooms recently, uh, and some of it is spent outside of the class entirely. Probably most of their collaboration was done outside of the class, but then they'd come in, they do some coordination, they divide up the tasks, and then meet on their own as needed, typically. Um, and you have to provide some plan for feedback, both from other students, preferably, and the instructor, and a process for revision. Um, because you know, if students are going to be posting their work publish publicly, you want it to be something that they're going to be proud of. And leveraging the feedback you have from peers, as well as your own feedback, can help improve that. And you know, if you just give students an assignment telling them that they have to create this by the end of the semester, they'll start working on it at the end of the semester, we all tend to procrastinate. So if you're having them do a big project, scaffolding it into a number of steps. When I had them working on the book project, um, I had them first submit, well, first as a class, they constructed the, the broad category and the outline, but then they were broken up into chapters and they came up with an outline for the chapters, which were then shared and they got feedback from the rest of the class and from me. Then they constructed a bibliography and then an annotated bibliography and revised their outline. Then they came up with a, um, in a lit review of the segments they were working on. And then they came up with, you know, a first draft and then a final draft before it was all done. And there was feedback all the way, both from other, from their peers, from other groups, and from me. And that's it, you know, if you want them to do reasonably good quality work that they're not going to be embarrassed by later, having that sort of feedback and making sure that they don't procrastinate as again, as we all tend to do. I know I do myself. So um, other issues you have to be concerned with is copyright and intellectual integrity issues. You know, you don't want them just copying and pasting. But a nice thing about these projects is because they are public facing, you know, students are aware and you may want to just gently remind them of that of copyright issues and that they can't just copy and paste things because other people can see it and they could, you know, file a takedown notice and so forth. And just talking about the value of their work 
can help reduce that. That hasn't been as much of a problem that I've seen with open pedagogy project, partly because they're generally they're often working in groups at least, and it's you know it's harder to just copy and paste things if you're working with others and you're coming up with a joint product. But also, again, students are, you know, if you break it down into small manageable chunks and you're giving them feedback along the way, it's really hard for them just to copy and paste things because it may not match very closely to what they, they're doing at that stage. But again, if you really want something that's sustainable, you have to find some way of hosting it in a way that will persist after the semester. You, if you do it within Blackboard, everything essentially disappears from public view at the end of the semester, and then eventually the course shells go away and it just disappears entirely. Um, so, But there are lots of public sites out there where you can create things that will last at least for some period of time. Um, and another thing you have to think about is how you're going to evaluate the contributions of individuals, since ultimately we grade individuals, not groups. Um, you might use some type of a peer evaluation system. Um, one simple thing, and this was a suggestion that I got from the person who had that 100-person book project, is in each group, what she had students do, and I do the same, is they work in Google Docs, and each student will create their, when they write text in their group's plan, they use a particular color code. And at the top of the document, they put the color, the color for each person's name. And it's pretty easy visually to see the contributions of the individuals just by looking through at the segments that they wrote, you know, in blue or in purple or red or whatever. Um, you, you know, you want to make sure there's sufficient contrast there to meet accessibility issues, but it's a fairly easy way to see the individual contributions just by looking at the segments written in a particular color. There's other ways too, but that was a nice easy way for me at least to be able to see it. But I also use some peer evaluations as well. And of course, anything you post digitally has to meet accessibility requirements. And there's been so many workshops this time on accessibility. Um, but it is important to make sure of that. And also letting students giving students a little bit of training on accessibility is really useful because this is something they're likely to have to, if they're going to be posting anything public in their future careers, whatever they're doing, it's likely they need to take accessibility requirements into account. Now, uh, when you cre have students create work, generally you release it under some type of Creative Commons licenses. And these are the, the, the standard Creative Commons license. Um, so this, the most public form of attribution is CC BY. I'm sorry, the most public form, the most open form of licensing for student work is CC BY, which means anyone can use their work for commercial or non-commercial use as long as they give students credit for their work. So basically their work would have to be cited. That's the, the most open form. Now, it could also be the CC by SA, which is the attribution is required in each of these, but the share alike provision is added so that that student that if they release it under this, anything that's created using it has to also be released under this license. So commercial applications could use this, but they have to make it anything that's created using that material also share alike so that anyone else can use anything created. Most commercial applications wouldn't use this work because it would essentially mean they'd have to release any work built on it under this license. Um, the no derivatives means that people can't modify the work that they've created. Non-commercial means it could only be used for non-commercial um, non commercial uses so that no one could sell anything that was created using their work. And then you can combine those things to form the last two. Um, students in my classes, basically in each of the classes chose the CC BY licensing. And so that will show up in the, the copyright for the work that they created. Um, so I don't think they have to worry too much about people taking it and publishing it and making millions off of the, the books they created. but. Um, but they, they were quite willing just to share the work and they unanimously agreed on it. I was really pleasantly surprised, surprised by that. And there's more information there. Um, 
One thing that I haven't done and I probably should that's often recommended is that you have students sign a release form so that they're releasing the copyright under the terms. You know, the, everything we did was all done as a joint decision and everyone bought in, but to cover yourself, it would probably not be a bad idea to have students sign a release saying that their their contributions to this are released under this Creative Commons license, whatever you know the class agrees to. Um, so um, I wanted to open this to questions. I was rushing through that a little bit. What types of assignments might you use or might you think about using for open pedagogy? And also, let me just share this with you before um we get to that come on oh there it is let me i'll just put this in chat this is a website where um i did a presentation about a year and a half ago maybe two years ago now um here we go okay so that's in chat uh it's a website that provides some resources and probably this is the most useful for sauce of this, um, the open pedagogy resources where there is examples of various things that could be done. And one thing I didn't mention is um, the student created ancillaries. One thing that many people have been do doing is having students create test banks or tests or other things that could be used either within that semester or in future semester. So questions, thoughts, reactions, has anyone tried an open pedagogy project or might you consider one? Well, I actually use the open pedagogy by having students complete a, a multiple types of projects like the blog and the e-portfolio with the Google site. Mm -hmm. um, the podcast I haven't gotten into yet, but I've considered um, and creating videos and then they link everything back to the Google site. Mm -hmm. So it becomes their portfolio that they can use in the future. And I did look back to see if anyone has accessed any of their Google sites and just a handful of students over the course of the past few semesters have continued. Um, so some of them have not, but we've used different social media platforms as well to create videos. And I do tell them to, for security purposes, to create a brand name. Um, so that in, like when they're creating a YouTube channel or any of the platforms that they're creating a name that's other than their own. So um, that helps protect them. Mm -hmm. as well. Okay, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Naja, is that for your technology course? Yeah, th that's for the technology. But, you know, I'm thinking like even with a disease class, you, you can actually use a blog and for assignments have students blog about specific diseases yeah, I was actually thinking about it for either disease or introduction to health promotion um, at the end of the semester. We kind of go through uh, the whole process of needs assessment program, planning program implementation, and we, we don't get quite to evaluation, but if they can blog about that process and, you know, reflect on it as they're going through it, um, it could be really effective to use next semester. Say, hey, look at what, you know, some what they did, what they encountered at these different phases, because we spend a full, say, six weeks minimum on that. So that could be a really nice reflective. I don't know if blogs are used as a reflective. They tool, often are. Yeah. yeah. I, it's interesting because um, I found that the students actually preferred to blog over creating videos. Mm. Um, and the reflection is my son today just he wanted to set up a blog for gaming. So part of that was helping him think about, you know, well, what's the purpose of this? What are you going to tell them? It's that same thing with our students, right? Here's an 11 year old that's thinking about it. But if we put it into the part of let's make this an assignment for our students, I think they get, it, they'll become more accustomed to it. Yeah, absolutely. Any John, other ideas? Mm -hmm. Oh, I just had a quick question before. Sure. Um, talking about the projects a, a bit more. Um, because this is going to be available to the public and I, I don't know if we call it published or whatsoever, but is it there at some point does SUNY Oswego need to be recognized in these artifacts? 
Well, as soon as Wego was going to pay for it, then yes, <laughs> that probably would be good. But I haven't seen any evidence that soon as Wego is going to pay for it. So <laughs> it would be nice. And, you know, that that podcast project at Vanderbilt just strikes me as a lot of fun and having students from different classes doing it. They vote on the best podcast from each class and then they're shared. And then there's some sort of rating overall in terms of what's the best student podcast that year from Vanderbilt. And so there's a little bit of gaming in there, but it seemed to work nicely. Okay. Thank you. But, but yeah, it would be nice if we provided more resources for that. So my, I have a question, John, or anybody else here who has done any of these projects. Um, so I teach art history and the bulk of students that I teach are not art history majors, they're studio artists. So when, I, when I've thought about doing some of these kinds of things over the years, and I guess the most, um, the closest thing would be having students write exhibition labels, um, which asks them mm -hmm. to then work in a different field as well, museum studies, which some of them are minoring in. But I guess my question for any of you who have done this is, do you find that it to be more successful, you're dealing with people who are majoring in the discipline? It doesn't happen. But there's a level of expertise that they're developing. They may find more intrinsic value in it if they're majoring in it, but it depends on what you have them do. Yeah, I teach the the 230 level of health and technology and a lot of students are hesitant. Some of them probably have anxiety when they first look at the syllabus, but what I tell them is I'm not looking for perfection. I'm just exposing them, right? Giving them, a, you know, some foundational information of how to use the tools. So if you're using it from the history standpoint, I mean, there's a lot of videos um, that are that have been created by by historians that use technology to educate populations, right? They've used their right skills and i think that's what you're tapping into like maybe creating a song out of it or some other like using the examples of the videos that have been created um it's just a different way of communicating information to populations right but the the i guess the 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 concerns that i always have is um i have to expect them to have a level of knowledge um just even in terms of research and understanding where to go, how to find good resources. And so I know what I, what I struggle with with my students is if they have to do any research, they wanna be able to just do it through Google. And you know whatever three top hits they get for Picasso, <laughs> they're gonna run with it. And the three top images, they're gonna run with it even if the images aren't even by Picasso, but they don't know that because of course, they're just going to the internet. So that I always, then that always makes me concerned that it's gonna become a lot of work for me just to kind of train them in the real kind of basic preliminary things, which I try to do in terms of evaluating sources and that sort of thing. But, um, but then the other concern is then if it goes public or goes beyond that, then what sort of liability or other concerns might I have to deal with for both um, the, the class as a group, the, you know, the institution itself and so forth. So I don't, I don't know and if those are other things that you guys have had to deal with, those of you who have. Well, if you're doing something in art right now, there's so many art galleries that have released some of their collection to the public domain, you know, or under Creative Commons licensing that that would at least deal with that issue to some extent, as long as students were, you know, if you gave students a list of some of the major museum sites that do allow their images to be shared publicly that would at least narrow down that but in terms of the quality of the work it you know the the work where students in my class do the highest level or is a capstone course and by then they generally have a, at least a, a fairly solid background in the discipline so that hasn't been as much of an issue in the intro class, I've just had them take the concepts of learning and in their podcast, apply them to what they're reading in the news or what they're seeing around them. For some reason, this pandemic was a major topic this spring into uh, this fall in terms of making connections. But, um, but there, they're trying to make their own connections and talking about how it impacts their life and their families and other things, which is a way which may not work too well in the art context or in terms of museum studies. Um, 
There's an example. I was just trying to think of where it was. It might be under. Um, and by the way, here with any of these, if you click on it, you can find examples. And that's what I was looking for. The fashion history timeline. It's not quite art, but um, although they may disagree. But uh, this is a website created by a fashion class at the Fashion Institute of Technology. And their students, you know, take take images and they put it in context and so forth. And you can see, and you can search by the, by well, there is artwork there too. So you could look at artwork, designers, and it's there's a series of essays created by students on these. And that's a really nice, um, a really nice example of an open pedagogy project. And that's one that keeps growing all the time. And they have tags so that it's searchable by all these content, by, you know, these different tags on it. I would also recommend, you know, John mentioned the scaffolding. So something that I do with my students is, you know, they might find it repetitive, but it, they realize in the end that it's preparing them is by giving them an assignment. Um, it's a very detailed outline and having them fill it in because then they're, it's, it's like writing a script, right? They have to know what goes into um, sharing a, an image and then you can also see where they're getting their resources from ahead of time um, and then making sure they cite their information so this way when they're they are using other images that they're citing those sources as well making that a requirement of the assignment that's what i do mm -hmm. but john i i have a question in regards to the copyright licensing and mm -hmm. the um disclosure uh, first my understanding is that the Google site, once they graduate, it's available to them as long as they keep using. As long as they keep their account active, yeah. As long as they keep their account active. Mm -hmm. uh, and, they and I did try to look into this where they can transfer ownership, administrator ownership to them themselves. I'm not sure about that. I'm, I'm, okay. I don't know enough about the blogger tool or Google sites. Um, I mean, I've worked with Google Sites, but I'm not, I'm not sure about changing the ownership. Okay. And then the next question was, do we need to have, you know, if they're signing documents for waivers, it sounds like we're getting into some legal technicalities. Do we need to have any specific departments, a legal department, look at what we're asking them to sign? Maybe. I don't know. Um, because I always gave students the option of just sharing it within the class or sharing it publicly. And in that case, since they all, if they, since they have the option of sharing it just within the class, they don't have to share it anywhere if they choose not to. And with a podcast project in two of the classes, about half of them chose to make the public, their podcast public. And in the other one, only maybe 20% of them chose to make the podcast public. Um, so, you know, they do have that option. And if someone wanted to take it down, I'm happy to take it down later, but that hasn't, hasn't happened. Um, when I did that Wikipedia project, though, I did have a student from, from Russia, actually, who did some analysis of, of um, the writings of Marx and Engels. Uh, and after he left and he returned to Russia, he actually deleted all of that. And I guess he was worried that he didn't want to have, because he was fairly critical and he probably didn't want to have that publicly out there when he goes back and starts applying for jobs and so or looking for jobs and um, being seen as, you know, perhaps a critique of the philosophy there. Um, you know, the, the, It, when they're releasing things under a Creative Commons license, it's a pretty standard type of, you know, agreement. And it's just, it's their choice of whether to do that or not. So um, the only reason for the waiver is basically my recollection of the form. And again, I haven't used it and I perhaps should, but um, is that it, they're, it, they're stating, they're committing to release their work under that license form. You know, they're not taking away any rights for their future use. They're not signing it over to someone else. They're just agreeing to publicly share it and let other people use it. And they get to choose at what level they're able to, they, they're willing to do so. 
So I'm not really sure there's much of a legal issue there. You know, it's not like we're taking a work and trying to profit off of it uh, or something. I don't know. Um, I have never really heard any issues about it. And the most I've seen is that a few people use a waiver form. Um, And there's no FERPA issues involved because you're not sharing their grades or any of that. You're just sharing their final product. And, and that, in many court cases, have been seen as not has been established to not be a FERPA violation. Because you're not sharing any information about their grading or their grades or, you know, any records that are specific that must be kept confidential. At least that's how I understand it. But this website here contains lots of, it contains examples and it also contains resources. So, and you know, there's some T for teaching podcasts there because we've talked to a lot of people who do this type of thing. Uh, and there's examples of, you know, how people have used various things. And that's in each of the categories. Uh, in this case, we only have one, uh, but, but there's, well, and I guess we don't have too many on that. Um, So there. Um, so you know that this could just give you some ideas for this. And then there's some. There was a SUNY task group on open pedagogy projects um, that I put together when I was the chair of the faculty assembly, uh, not faculty assembly, the SUNY Fact Two Council. Um, and then I stepped down, and now I'm back as chair again. But we're working on different things now. But um, here's some. Here are some SUNY open pedagogy projects. And there's a whole series of webinars in there and so forth. And here's a listing of ones that people throughout SUNY have been working on. And there's the Open Pedagogy Notebook, which is put together by, um, by Robin DeRosa and a colleague. And many people just share information there on their Open Pedagogy projects. And it's a nice community uh, that you're, you, know, you can join and find out more information. But it's all open and public on the web. I've enjoyed it. And for the most part, I think students have enjoyed it. Any other, any questions or thoughts or questions? Now, we were part of the SUNY Create project. I think some of you may have known about that last year. Uh, we put in an IITG grant a year and a half, well, two years ago now, I guess, and we received it. There were four institutions. We got, we were able to acquire 500 reclaim hosting domain of your own accounts uh, with, I believe, 500 gigabytes of data. And that shared among, that was shared among the four institutions. Um, we had applied for an expansion for that through the IITG grant program last year, and we were the top ranked program. Uh, however, the funding for that dried up. So the funding went away and the grant was not continued. However, SUNY Oneonta was fronted. We each went to our institutions to see if they'd pay a share of it because the cost per year is only five thousand. Was it five thousand dollars? Yeah. So the cost per institution would be twelve hundred and fifty dollars to continue that. Our institution was not willing to come up with the money for that, but SUNY Oneonta did, and they've kept it going. So if anyone wants to play with one of the reclaim hosting accounts. Thanks to them and their funding, and I think we st there's still some open accounts there. That would be a possibility, but the funding for that drives up the dries up this summer unless either participating institutions or some other group in SUNY provides for that. But um, it's an interesting project, and this this takes you to it. Um, the reclaim hosting sites is again the domain of your own is a site where each student or each faculty member, depending on how they choose to do it, receives basically their own service space with access to a whole host of um, whole host of resources, including various web servers, includes WordPress site, it includes Scala, it includes 
um, various databases that can be used. And, you know, you've got, it's a possibility. And I know we have at least one faculty member who's going to be experimenting with that this spring. If anyone wants to, I can get you an account there. Um, but there's no guarantee it will continue past the spring. Um, for my own projects, I just paid for them uh, for my students. I paid for a podcast channel, uh, and I'm using the same podcast channel with each class and just adding new seasons as we go to it, because that way I don't have to pay for multiple podcast channels. Um, and if for the book project, I'm using something called Pressbooks, um, and you can use Pressbooks for free. But if you want to have it so that you can, if you want to have more storage or if you want to have, um, if you want to remove the, the, the watermarks on each page and so forth, there's a one-time fee that you can pay. I think it's like $95, but then students have, have that. It remains out there indefinitely from that point, at least as long as Prexbooks stays in business. Um, so the two books that students have created so far are out there, and I paid for it each time. Actually, one time the department paid for it. Last year, I paid for it since money had had uh, dried up on campus, um, and I'll probably pay for it again this year if they choose to do it. I gave them the choice of doing this or the research papers that they had done in the past, and both years the class liked this choice. Any other questions? Okay, look through this resource. And again, I really suggest looking at the Open Pedagogy Notebook to get a really good broad perspective on Open Pedagogy. I'll stop the recording.